Do y'all know this song? No. You don't? No, Some of you adults know. Mm -hmm. It's as easy to pick up on. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Almighty, most holy God. And I need this kind of beat right here. That's a good one, isn't it? This is my father's world. Amen. I hear you know that when I hear some humming going on.
think of that song every springtime. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus, I am resting, resting. Are you resting in the Lord this morning? Okay, let's don't clap on this one. This is a peaceful song. <clears throat> Jesus, I am resting, resting. It's the joy of are healed. Amen.
flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Father, thank you for your presence here today. Help us to focus on you, Lord. Help us to turn our hearts toward you, Lord, and turn our hearts away from this world. Help us to get our feet out of this world and into the kingdom of God. Help us to stop straddling the fence between righteousness and immorality. Help us to walk in, in grace and mercy today, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Does anybody have any prayer needs this morning? Okay. Prayer for salvation, a prayer for protection. For a lot of stuff. A lot of things. Pray hey, for our Carol nation. Williams wrote this morning and said one of her neighbors has apparently disappeared and everybody is out searching for her. Okay. So pray that they find her safely. Okay. Amen. A missing person. What if Miss Sasser is God? Say it again. Miss Sasser, Miss Sasser. Okay. One of Miss Sasser's stepfather had a car wreck. He hurt his leg, but he's recovered. Okay. Now. Okay. We'll pray for Miss Sasser's stepfather. I want to thank the Lord for helping us to find Paul. Amen. Like hearing those praise reports. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to back up a little bit because I think I'm in the camera too much. I have a praise report last week. Um, my grandfather, Alvin, um, his back has been painful and his finally is recovering from it. And he says he's doing better. Amen. Amen. Praise That's praise good. Praise God for that. <clears throat> that is good. <clears throat> okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for these needs. Father, we come before you today lifting up these needs. Those that have been mentioned, Father, in faith. Asking, Lord, humbly to that you would meet these needs, Lord, that your will would be done. We pray for protection of those that are traveling, protection of those that are still at home, Father. We ask, Lord, that you heal this one that has been injured in this wreck. Lord, we ask for um, salvation to come to this one that needs to be saved. Lord, let someone come into that person's life, Father, that, that uh, can reach them. Lord, so often... A prophet's without honor in his own country, and people will not listen to their own family. And I just pray that someone would, would come into their path that they would respect and listen to, and, Lord, that they would be brought back to Jesus and to the cross and would be saved. And, Father, we just ask that you um, be with us in this service, that you guide us. Let the Holy Spirit be here and have your way in, in everything that we're doing today. Father, we pray for our nation and for the nation of Ukraine and for the nation of Russia. We know that even in Russia there are innocent people. There are people of God. We know that, that the people of Ukraine are being persecuted and the people of Russia are largely not for this war. And we just pray, Father, that your will would be done and that you would stop evil men from uh, pursuing their own ventures, Lord. 
and would follow your will. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. To that list. Okay. Nina Redding, a uh, medical situation, and his, uh, uh, Christy's um, mama had heart surgery this past week and okay. asked for prayer. Okay. Nina Redding and Christy's mother? Yes. Okay. Please remember them in prayer. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Oh, and Miss Lily May. I'm going to adjust this projector just a minute. Try to keep the, the scripture up here for you. You on the couch here are just out of luck because it's behind you. You'll just have to look it up. I don't know if this helps anybody or not. It may not, but it does. Okay. Hey, yeah. we need to add Miss Lily May to that list. Miss Lily May, absolutely. Thank you, Polly. We're in Judges. Oh, excuse me. We're not in Judges. I was looking at Judges. We're in Nehemiah chapter 6 today. Nehemiah chapter 6. Go ahead and find it for, you, for your uh, reference. <clears throat> I don't know if any or all of you have regular Bible study, but you really should try it if you've not been doing it. You really should try Bible study. When I start doing the message each week, I know Andy can attest to this, Angie can do this for her ladies' Bible study. When I start doing it, I get so excited about what I'm about to find. And when I start going through there, I'm amazed at how things tie together. Anybody that says the, the Bible is chaos and it's full of contradictions or whatever they tell you, they're lying to you. They've never studied the Bible. The Bible is amazing in the way it is brought together. And I want you to see some things. That, and so many times when I'm studying what I normally do is a base passage where we're looking at the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is one of the better, better ones to look at for study because each chapter is its own of uh, devotion, if you will, or own meaning. Like each chapter, not some of the books of the Bible, the chapters are not really divided that way. You know, those were those addresses, if you will, were put in there for us to find scripture, right? But Nehemiah, each one is, is like an, its own topic. <clears throat> and if you look at Nehemiah, we've gone through all the things, right? We started out in the first chapter where Nehemiah heard about something and he was moved and he was brought to a place where he wanted to change Jerusalem, where he wanted to build the walls and gates back, right? Then we went through the second chapter where he went and he inspected everything, and the king gave him the, the means to go in and gave him the material. And then he went in the third chapter where he actually had to inspect and he went around all the gates, and we studied the gates, right? And the gates were progressive of all things in our walk. And it was very interesting, even that those two that were separated in another chapter, we found they were prophetic, right? They were for a time to come. And I'm just amazed at, at how every time God shows me something, there's a scripture that comes to my heart, and I'm thinking, uh, it's almost like I'm thinking, okay, that's strange. I don't think that it would tie to this. I don't see a, a scripture reference to this. And yet when I go to it, the exact word is in there or the exact phrase or the exact meaning or or it's almost like God helps me to focus on the first one. You really need to find Bible study interesting. And I, I told Angie last night after I made my, my notes, let me just show you my notes. Here's my notes for today's message. You see how gibberish it looks? 
Everybody see that? It's just gibberish and I have some bullet points on there. And then over here on the back page, I've got some definition. You see that? I just make, in my own way, notes like that. And, and to me, that's just a starting line. Right? When you're doing Bible study, you can write down themes and thoughts. And that's just your starting point. That's, that's the starting line. That's not the finish line of your Bible study. Right? When you go through there, go through your bullet points and then expand on that. Go through your interesting phrases, something somebody said or did, or something you see repeated in there, <coughs> or some number in there. As I always say, there's nothing in there by accident. It means something. So we're going to go through this this morning. Now, when Nehemiah wrote this, he had no idea the depth of what he was writing. When he recorded this, he had no idea that you and I would be walking in the new covenant, having understanding of things, knowing the Messiah. He never knew all that. But it was less than 500 years past his time that Jesus came. It was not that, that many generations later that Jesus walked around these same walls that Nehemiah and the people of Israel had built. The gates that, that Nehemiah and his, his people built and put back were, were walked through by Jesus. Amen. Think about that. What, a, what about something that you've done? It might not be something that you think, well, God will never see this. Yes, he will. Well, people, nobody will ever see this. You'll be surprised at what God is watching in your life. You'll be surprised at what he pays attention to. God, Jesus himself, who is God, Jesus walked through these gates and I wonder how many times he thought about Nehemiah when he walked through there. Right? right? right. God's watching. Yes, he is. And I, as I told Angie last night, when I got through my, my chicken scratch writing and scribbled through here, I folded it up. I went in here and I said, I can hardly wait for Bible study in the morning. She said, why? I said, because I just can't wait to see what God does with this. Because so many times, and she's attested to this in her ladies' Bible study, so many times when I'm given this, it's like, I didn't make that note. I, how did I remember that? God, the Holy Spirit brings it back to mind. The Holy Spirit gives me insight. The Holy Spirit starts, like, all of a sudden, I have a thought. And I've heard preachers before say it, and I feel like that too. That's good preaching even, even if I am doing it. You know, sometimes it's like, I hear myself and I'm thinking, yes! So listen to the word this morning. And let the Holy Spirit guide you through it. Nehemiah chapter 6. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 6. We are looking this morning at grace and discernment. Grace and discernment. Now the last chapter we looked at... <clears throat> I don't know what I titled it, but the last chapter was about, um, I think it was called Charity at Home. It was about having your own brothers and sisters and not treating them as enemies and being, being like brothers and sisters to each other. That's what chapter 5 was about. In chapter 6, verse 1, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some of, some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should, I, should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them, and after the same manner. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest a wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shalt shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. You remember the old enemies, right? Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian. 
the three named, and then it says there's others. And, and Nehemiah is trying to get something done. Have you ever found that when you focus on something, the enemy just comes in and tries to stop you? When you, try to, when you have a goal, you always get these attacks, don't you? <coughs> and here we've got attacks from Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arabian. The status of the wall is the walls are finished, but the gates haven't been hung. The gates haven't been put up there. Maybe the hinges haven't made, been made. Maybe waiting on some blacksmith. There may be some, but there's there's 12 gates, right? That's what we study. 12 gates. So there's 12 gates that need to be hung. Some of these gates are fairly large, right? As wide as a modern highway. These gates had to be put up because, you know, without gates, the enemy can still come in. The wall can be there, but if you got the gate open, the enemy can come in. We know about having the gate open and the chickens get out, right? Or the, or the cow get out. We know that you can't leave the gate open. Sand Ballot and Geshem in verse 2 sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in one of the, vi the villages in the plain of... Oh, no. You see that? Oh, no. So where do you want me to meet you? Oh, no. The name tells, tells him not to go there, right? I mean, I'm making light of that. But so many times it's so plain. We wonder why people fall for foolishness from the enemy. And it's so plain that they shouldn't have done that. Right? Oh, no. Don't go there. Right? Verse 3, And I sent messengers of them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Now look at the point where they come to him. Look at the point where they've reached it. Oh, Christian, you should just take a break. Right? The walls are up. You've made so much progress, Christian. You've made so much progress, people of God. All you need is the gates left. Can't you just take a break? Have you ever heard the devil try to get you to stop for a while? You know this church business that you're doing, that Bible study, that's all fine. You just, need, you just need a sabbatical, right? You need to go on a retreat. You just need a little rest from that, right? And when the devil comes at you like that, that's probably when he's about to attack you, right? He's about to attack you. And they sent four times, and then the fifth time he sent a servant with an open letter. And the letter says, this time, instead of saying, come and meet us, the open letter says, we've heard rumor that you have decided to set yourself up as king, and as soon as these walls are finished, you're going to, you're going to rebel and you're going to be king. You're going to be isolated from real people. You're going to be isolated from good people. You're going to be separated. Do you think a Christian would do that? Do you think a Christian would not just go out and love everybody? Why do you want division? Would Jesus do that? And they start telling you all these things. And when he says this, he comes down. And he says, come now therefore and let us take counsel together. You know what this is, you know what this is in the modern vernacular? We need to talk. <laughs> right? Uh, Nehemiah, we need to talk. A text message that says, I've heard rumors about you in the community. We need to talk. When that enemy who has done nothing all the time but changed their story, and now they're coming up with a new slant, right? In times past, they mocked you. In times past, they attacked you. In times past, they lied about you, and now they act like they're doing it for your benefit. Mm -hmm. They're still the enemy. It's still the same snake, That's right. right? But I, what I want you to notice today is there was five attacks. Now, that number rang with me last night when I was studying this. There was five attacks. So I started looking up, what, what does five mean? And five in the Bible is the number of grace. 
It's the number of grace. David had five smooth stones. There was five loaves of bread at Jesus' miracle feeding the multitude. There's five books of the Pentateuch in the Old Testament, the, the law, the first five books of the Bible. The Ten Commandments are divided into two fives. Five laws that have to do with God, five that have to do with man. The tabernacle has five curtains, five pillars, five sockets, and the altar is five cubits square. The anointing oil has five ingredients in it. There are five types of sin of offerings. Sin offering, the peace offering, the meat offering, the burnt offering, and the trespass offering. Um, coincidence. No. It means something, doesn't it? And it's for God's grace. Well, how can God's grace come in five attacks? Now, here's where I found it interesting. Let's look at um, 2 Corinthians 12. 7 through 10. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 12. So hold your place in Nehemiah 6. We're going back there. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Because when I thought about grace, the scripture that came to mind was where God told, told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So 5 means grace. My grace is sufficient for you. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that, I might de that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Let's stop right there. Paul had something and we, many people believe it was a physical ailment and many people also believe it was his eyes because several places say where he says that he writes with large writing, right? He has somebody else writing. He says, now this is my writing. In other words, the scribe that I'm dictating this to is not writing. I'm writing this with, see what large letters I write, he says. And a lot of people believe that his eyes were not good, that he couldn't see well. Now, people that believe that, oh, if you're a king's kid, then you're supposed to be healed, then that doesn't go along with their theology, so they said that couldn't be. It, it said it was a messenger to buffet him in the flesh so he wouldn't be exalted above measure. A thorn in his flesh. A thorn in his flesh. Have you ever had a thorn in your flesh? Have you ever had something that just... You're trying to do the Lord's work, but you've got arthritis in your hand, right? Amen? Amen. Some of us can attest to that. You, you're trying to, to do what's right, but you don't have the strength in some area of your body. You don't, you're tone deaf, but you're trying to lead singing. You know what I'm talking about? You've got some shortcoming physically. You've got something about you. In order that I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations... Paul would have been a superman, wouldn't he? Yeah. But he had some kind of physical problem, I believe, that kept him. And he said, lest Satan should buffet me. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace. Now, what do we use the word grace for? Unmerited favor. We know that it stands for unmerited favor is what it means in, in the original language. Unmerited favor. We, we've heard expressions of grace, like a grace period when you have your insurance that's overdue for payment and they have a 10 day grace period or a 30 day grace period, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, a grace period? So we have grace. A police officer pulls you over, you're doing 65 and a 55, he pulls you over and he says, I'm not gonna give you a ticket, I'm gonna give you a little warning. That's grace, right? So, but so many times we think that grace is unmerited favor. Woo, I got it all happening. I just got a bonus. I just got a raise. I got everything happening. You know, somebody decided to come in and buy my meal. That that's an unmerited favor. That's not what the term that is used in it is it. Look, think carefully about how the word grace is given. It's not like I, everything's just good and rosy and there's rainbows and unicorns and butterflies everywhere. No, that's not it. He literally says, my God, God said His grace was sufficient through this weakness. Through the weakness. He wasn't going to be healed if it was a physical problem. He was not going to be healed 
this, this thorn in his flesh was not going to be removed. Why? Because God said, I'm going to be gracious to you. <coughs> wow. That almost sounds like when Adam and Eve sinned and he said, the ground's cursed for your sake. For your sake. I'm cursing the ground for your good. I'm cursing the ground to benefit you. Right? His grace is sufficient through the hard times. <clears throat> Look at the second part of that section. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecution, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Did you notice that there are five things right there? Wow. Yeah, I said it last night. I said it out loud. Wow. Now, remind you that I was just looking from Nehemiah 6 to Word Grace that so brought me to this, and then there's five things there, and I'm thinking, wow, five things. So now let's look at those five things. Let's look at the grace. Now, Nehemiah was under attack. So we've got it wrong when we say, God, give me your grace. And what we're thinking is, take away these attacks. Oh, yes. Yes. Right? And we've been wrong in doing that. Right. Give me your grace, God. Give me, just give me your grace. You think the grace is going to be when all your bills is paid, right? When husbands and wives can be sweet and kiss each other and, and kids are going to be obedient and we're going to be the model family. That's not it, folks. The grace comes through the attacks. Hey, Paul said, I'm going to be... Therefore, I, I glory in my infirmities. I glory in them most gladly. Wait a minute, Paul. Are you crazy? Are you crazy that you would glory in this? That you get excited in this? He said, I glory in this because that's when God's grace can be shown. If you don't have these things, these, fight, these attacks, God's grace can't be shown. You know what would happen if you really had your bills paid and your husband sweet to you and all that stuff? You know what would happen? I must be pretty good. I must be, I must have it happening because that's what Paul said. Should, less shall I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of my beauty, through the abundance of my genius IQ, through the abundance of my wisdom, Right? Oh, wow. Keeping us down. Now, he said, I will, I will glory, therefore, in, and take pleasure. What? Take pleasure in this? You can when you know that it's for your good. I take pleasure in infirmities. I looked up the, the original Greek and all these, the infirmities. Weakness, mental and physical, including sickness and ailments. Well, God, I just know your will is for me to be completely healed. I know that your will is to be whole. and Because, you know, I want to be able to get up and move around. I don't, this arthritis, I want to be whole. Yes. yes. God, he, Jesus healed people when he walked this earth. But Paul was not healed if that was a physical ailment. That thorn in his flesh was not healed. <clears throat> he, he said, I'd glory and in, take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches. Insulting speech or conduct, being ostracized or left out. Have you ever been left out because you're trying to do what's right? Have you ever been ostracized because you're not one of us? Right? You don't fit in with us. They're doing you a favor, folks, when you're ostracized. Reproaches, insulting speech or conduct. The third one was necessities. Need of something, not having basic elements of life. When I looked at that, I think, wait a minute. God's, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. I know that he doesn't always give us our wants, right? right. I've got that new Pearl Cadillac out there, and that's my want, but I'll drive a Chevrolet, right? No. Sometimes he doesn't even give you the needs because there's something you need to learn. What, what is fasting? Right? It's cutting out some need. You have a need for food. Right? right? 
when Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted. He, he was cut out of those things that he needed. We're not talking about he, did, he didn't um, go down and watch entertainment for 40 days and 40 nights. We're not talking about Jesus didn't get around his friends and party and that kind of thing for 40 days. We're talking about he didn't have food. He might not have had water because he was the son of God. He didn't have things for 40 days and 40 nights. He fasted. The necessities, Paul says, he takes pleasure in the need of something, not having basic elements of life. What did the children of Israel do in the Old Testament when they were brought out of Egypt? They started murmuring about, oh, you brought us out here into the wilderness and we don't have food or water. And then when he brought them food and water, and he said, all we've got is this manna. Mm -hmm. That's all we got. They weren't even glad for the basic needs. God was trying to show them, I will supply your need when it's time. Right? I mean, we know how to deal with children that are like that, right? You don't give them more when they whine about it. You say, you know what, smart aleck, I think you're just going to have to do without, right? You're just going to have to see what it's like. And God says to us, you think you need it? You only need me. Man does not live by bread alone. By the necessities. And the fourth one is persecutions. Pers this, remember, this is the original meaning of these words that Paul says he takes pleasure in. Punishment to someone of a severe nature because the person falls into a group that they don't like. So persecuted, you're persecuted because you're a Christian. Right? We know about other kinds of persecutions that people are persecuted because they fit in certain groups. You're the wrong color, you're the wrong gender, or whatever. God says that's persecution. Take pleasure in it. I went to a diversity class and the company I went in uh, working in many years ago. It's probably been 15 years ago now. And one of the things that they said was write down a word one single word of how you felt when you got treated differently. Tell, tell a word. So I had to think about it. Now, at the time, I was really focusing on I'm supposed to be different as a Christian. And so I started thinking about it. And when he got to me, he said, he said, well, Paul, what's your word? I said, I'm really trying to come up with it because I said it's all of you are given like hurt, harmed, um, sad, and those kind of things. I said, that's not the way I feel. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, as a Christian, I'm supposed to be different. And I said, when I'm treated different, that gives me joy that I know that I'm living right. And he said, well, maybe affirmed. I said, yes, affirmed. And everybody's looking at me like, what? Well, who is this nut? But let me tell you something. When you're ostracized, when you're persecuted because of being not part of the group, they're doing you a favor, folks. It's going to happen and take pleasure in that. The last one is distresses. I love this part. I love this part. It had very little definition it was not like some of the other greek words that had a lot of definition it means a narrow place a narrow place paul says i take pleasure in being in a narrow place those of us who have claustrophobia don't like narrow places we don't like being confined do we we don't like having the walls closing in but as we watch the Pilgrim's Progress, Christian was going up that hill and it was so narrow and it was so confined and he was going through there and he was trying to get, and when he got to the top of the hill, the burden fell off. You're supposed to be in a narrow place. I, I wrote my, my modern vernacular of that is between a rock and a hard place. That's what we're supposed to be in, Christians. We're supposed to be confined. What was Nehemiah doing? Nehemiah was, had all these things going on. He was being ostracized by the larger group outside the wall. 
He had re reproaches. He had necessities. He had persecutions. He had infirmities. He had distresses. He had all these things. He was attacked five times, right? And he was between a rock and a hard place. Now go back to Nehemiah chapter 6. <coughs> I'm telling you, that's good preaching even if I am doing it. Verse 8. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou thainest them out, with thine, uh, out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. This little short passage lets us know that it bothered him. It was, he was afraid. He didn't go over walking around cocky and act like, I know that I'm doing God's will, and because I know it, there's nothing going to happen to me. Let me tell you something, folks. It's okay if you get afraid of things. It's going to be normal in times of the battle when you get fearful. You know, a soldier on the battlefield is very often afraid, but he presses on through. At times, he's stuck in a foxhole when somebody yells charge, and everybody starts charging, and he's still sitting there shaking. Sometimes he's holding his gun and he can't get aim because he's shaking so much. But then something has to grip him and he has to move on through. Because if he stays there, he dies. That's right. That's right. If you're afraid, if you're afraid, you've got to press on through. Because in the end of this, in verse 9, he says, they all made us afraid. They made us afraid. They was lying. Everybody in the, in the, the group inside Jerusalem, inside where the walls were. Everybody was behind Nehemiah. But what about the Jews that were outside? What about the people that were outside? Are they going to believe these rumors? Stop and think about your own life. Is anybody lying about you right now? Is anybody telling rumors about you? Probably, even though you may not even know about it. And in the end of that, he says, Now therefore, O God... Strengthen my hands. Yes. Give me strength, God. Sometimes a quick prayer is needed. In 1 Peter 1.13, Peter writes, To gird up the loins of your mind. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, Paul talks about taking every, cap every thought captive. Taking every thought captive. If you've ever had a traumatic experience where you've had someone die in front of you, or you've had a family member taken away without, without you even expecting it, or, or something, you've got a, a bad uh, report from the doctor, or whatever it is, you've got to get that, take that thought captive, haven't you? You've got to get control of it. You've got to make sure that your mind can't go there, right? Maybe it is past, maybe it's past hope. You can't bring that person back from the dead. Maybe whatever's happened, I can't even bring up some of the horrible things that I've been through. I, I couldn't go there. My mind had to stay focused and get through the day, right? Just get through the day. The next morning you wake up, you've got one more day to get through, and you can finally put that behind you. Take every thought captive and gird up the loins of your mind. That means don't let all these little whispers of the enemy Start bringing you down, but make sure that you focus on eternity, right? Now, this next section, verse 10. Afterward, I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delilah, the son of Mahidabel, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. And I said, should, a, should such as I, a man as I flee? And who is there that being a, as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. 
Okay, I had to do a little research on that, all this because, I, okay, who is Shemaiah and why was he shut up? And why would Nehemiah go to him? Because Nehemiah willingly went to a man named Shemaiah. Who was he and why was he shut up? So when I, when I researched through this, when he says he, he was shut up, it meant that he was a prophet because the prophets basically stayed praying, right? They just fo focused on God, focused on God, focused on God, praying. They were shut up. They didn't let, they didn't go out and do the affairs of life. They were stayed, then they were in their prayer closet, so to speak. And Shemaiah was a prophet that me Nehemiah must have had some respect for. He knew him. At least a man had some type of uh, image in the community that he was a man of God. And he went into Shemaiah, and he went in, and, and think, about, think about what happens here. He went in, and Shemaiah says, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night they will come to slay thee. What does he tell him? He says, Nehemiah, the best thing for you to do is to go in the temple and lock the doors. You and I will stay in there. And we'll be locked the doors. Well, that might sound smart. But Nehemiah said, I can't stop what I'm doing. If I go in there, nobody else is going to work. Moms, you know what happens when you tell your kids to clean their room and you leave. They stop. As long as you're not standing there watching them. Right? And Nehemiah said, if I go into the temple... Everybody's going to say, well, Nehemiah, you've led us up till now. Nobody's going to take the initiative to finish this. Nehemiah said, I can't stop what I'm doing. And he said, let's go in the temple. And now, if you've gone to somebody to ask them the question that you already know the answer to, and they tell you the other answer, you know they're wrong. Mm -hmm. See, he already knew the answer. He already knew that God was going to say, you continue on, Nehemiah. My protection is there. You've already got your hand on the sword. Remember that chapter? We got our hand on the sword, and we're working with our right hand, and our, and our sword's on our left. Right? And he said, I already know the answer. I want Shemaiah to confirm to me. Sometimes the confirmation is from the devil. Sometimes it's from the devil, and he tells you, what everybody else has been telling you. Well, am I wrong in separating my kids from all these other kids that are into all this worldly stuff? And if you go to somebody and they, at the church and you say, well, I respect this pastor, or I respect this elder, or I, you know, I've got this friend I haven't talked to in a while, but they're, they're Christian. And you go to them and they say, you just need your ch children to play with other children. Maybe that, Maybe your children can bring the others to the Lord. Maybe you need to let your children go to these rock concerts. Maybe you need to let them go to these Harry Potter festivals. Maybe they can be a lie and witness to them. They're lying to you. They're lying to you. He went into this prophet who was shut up, and his prophet said, let's go down to the temple and lock the doors because they're going to come get you in the night. And then Nehemiah said in verse 12, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was just like Balaam. You remember Balaam, the prophet that the donkey talked to? He was about to go in because the enemy was hired Balaam to go in and curse Israel. Just because someone says prophet or clergy, or they say, I'm a Christian. Don't You don't have to listen to them. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit. So now we get into discernment. We've looked at grace. And discernment follows the grace. When you've gone through infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses, when you've gone through those five things, God's grace is there for you through those things, right? And those things bring discernment to your mind. That's the tie-in here today. Grace and discernment. The discernment comes through the experiences. When you've been on the battlefield, you've been in a foxhole, 
and they tell you to charge and you get up and you fire and you're going toward the enemy when you're doing that, doing that and you learn that if you listen to what your commander's telling you to do, you've got a much better chance. Your commander's not going to tell you to charge on the battlefield if there's no chance for you. They don't want to lose soldiers. It takes a long time to get a soldier trained up in the real world as a real soldier. <coughs> Consequently, God's not going to tell you to continue charging if he is, he's not going to go, wait a minute, I didn't know this was going to happen. But we see him that way sometimes. We think, God, are you really sure? He said, I perceived that God had not sent him. Now, I want to look at discernment a minute. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. The discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Uh-huh. Between right and almost right. Right and wrong, that's easy. Discernment is the gray areas, right? Between right and almost right. See, it sounded right to go in to the temple, right? Wouldn't that be the right thing to do? Maybe you just need a break right now. Maybe you just need to go into the temple. That was almost right, right? And it would have led him to destruction. They would have, they'd said, you can get him now because he's in the temple. We know exactly where he is. Otherwise, we've got this massive wall. He's at one of the 12 gates. He's not in his office. He's down at the temple now. Go get him. Right? You don't stay in one spot. If this country comes under attack, the president does not stay in Washington, D.C. He gets on Air Force One, and he goes somewhere. And sometimes they do this thing where they're uh, sending out decoys, and they'll send out Air Force One, and he won't be on it. And the enemy says, oh, there's Air Force One. He's not on that plane. He's somewhere else. He's at Camp David, or he's somewhere in California, or he's at a lot of military bases, and the president can be there. When you're telling the enemy, I'm right here, I'm right here. You make a fixed target, right? Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm not going to the temple. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and wrong. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. <clears throat> but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For lo, they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. This passage tells us that some things are spiritually discerned. The natural man doesn't receive that. That's why people all around you will tell you you're doing the wrong thing when you know good and well that's the right thing to do. Because you have the mind of Christ and they don't. They can even be people with the label of Christian. They can say, yeah, I'm a Christian. What they will be telling you, the wrong thing. They're all doing this. The majority of them are doing this. And a few of you are doing this. You're the remnant. That's right. You're spiritually discerning. That's right. You are the few who are actually listening to the Holy Spirit. You are in the net straight and narrow. You are in the narrow place. Right? Everybody else gets up there and they walk on the, the trail that's headed down or the wide road. Jesus said the wide road goes to hell. The narrow spot is what goes to heaven. Amen? So spiritually discern things having the mind of Christ. In, first, in um, 
1 Corinthians 12, it talks about having your mind renewed, right? Having your mind renewed by the Word of God. Levi. Having your mind renewed by the Word of God. Do you read the Word of God? Do you study it? I know you're all here today. Those of you under my voice, you're, you're hearing it today. But do you really study it? Do you really read it and think about it? Do you spend personal time? I'm not talking about just memorizing verses. That's good. I'm talking about knowing what it says. I'm talking about taking some time to think about it. When you get instructions from a supervisor, you can pay attention or you can just say, okay, what is it you want me to do? Okay, I'll do it. And then you may end up doing it wrong. Have you ever had one of those little trick test that every teacher seems to give their class at some point. It's like 15 things to do. And the first one's like, draw a circle on the right top side of this page. And then the next one says, write your name at the bottom. And the next one is, you know, circle the first, the number one on the first question. And you go down through there and then you get to number 15. It says, don't make any marks on this paper. This is just to tell you to see if you actually are reading the instructions first. Because it says read all the instructions first before you do it. And and I had that given to me. And I didn't. I was like, I want to get through this. I want to get through this. But it was just to see if I knew how to. And so many times, you know, we, we know dealing with kids. Like, okay, I want you to go down and get the Windex. I want you to clean the <laughs> windows. And like, okay, I know I had something to do with windows. I Did they want me to put my thumbprint on the windows? You know, we have to make sure we understand everything from God, right? Have the mind of Christ and be spiritually discerned. 1 John 4.1 1 John 4.1 1 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Try the spirits. It's not wrong for you to test and see, even something I'm telling people, go and, go and study the Word and find out yourself. If I'm telling you wrong, don't listen to me. If what I'm telling you doesn't line up with the Word of God, I don't care if I'm, I'm pastor to you, I'm papa to you, I'm husband to you, I'm father-in-law to you, I'm father to you, I don't know, care what the relationship I have with you. If I tell you wrong, you don't listen to me. Right. Paul said that. He said, I've already told you the truth. If I or a spirit anywhere else tells you that, you don't listen to it. I've already told you. All right? John says, to try the spirits whether they are of God. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Paul writing to Timothy, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, and forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. This is an interesting passage, because it sounds holy. It sounds holy. But he literally says, Some shall depart from the faith, that means they've already brought, been brought in to the understanding of God, the believing of God, but they'll depart from it, giving heed to seducing spirits. Let me just give you examples of one of these seducing spirits. You've got freedom in Christ. That means nothing you do matters because your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. doesn't matter what you do. A seducing spirit. That's right. Oh, you're not saved by works anyway. You don't have to do anything. A seducing spirit. As long as you've said the prayer, you're saved. No? Seducing spirit. Departing from the faith, giving, giving heed to seducing spirits, and having their conscience seared. I don't have to worry about that. I don't feel guilty about that or remorse or conviction or anything you want to call it. I don't have to be guilty anymore. I used to. I used to feel guilty. And then it, after a while, I wasn't 
quite so guilty about it, but now I don't feel guilty at all. That's a dangerous place. That means having your conscience seared. The thing that you used to think was sinful, and now you don't. Let me just give you an example of what I've watched in some people as I've lived through the years and seen them change. I've seen people that it used to be they, they were very polite. They didn't speak in cursing or swearing. And then they got older and they kind of relaxed in their standards and they just sort of said ugly words because, well, I'm, they know I'm old. I've seen that in a lot of people. They just get older and they think, yeah, I used to be real strict about that, but hey, everybody cusses. Everybody swears. And when you, when you, when you start doing things that you used to not do, you're in, you're in danger. Had a supervisor many years ago, or not that many years ago, six, seven years ago, he had gotten near retirement. He had had a heart attack. He had gone in and had bypass surgery. He had um, gotten to the age where he could retire, and he retired. And I found out less than two years later, I got news that he had a heart attack and died, a massive heart attack and died. But wow, that's sad. He only lived two years after his retirement. Then I, then I heard this. This is the important part. When he retired at age 65, he started smoking. And he was smoking nonstop after having heart disease and heart bypass surgery and all that. And in his mind, he must have just thought, who, what, who cares? I'm old. I hadn't smoked all these years. I'm going to start smoking. I could do that. I haven't smoked since I was a teenager and was sneaking around behind the barn. I haven't smoked since then. What if I started smoking? Because, hey, I'm old. You know? When you start doing things that you used to not do, you're having your conscience seared. I'm just using the physical. Now, I'm not saying that that was a sinful thing for him to do, but that was using the physical thing. Sometimes in the spirit, we like we get real lax. You used to be on church to church on time all the time, and now you only make it two or three times a year. Right? Have you ever seen somebody like that? They got saved. They were on fire for God. They were studying their Bible, and then after a while, they just kind of fell away. Marriages do that. People, relationships with God do that. Uh, Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is the discerner in the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God. We're talking about discernment. We're talking about grace. God's grace is given. His discernment's given. The Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. I can't emphasize it enough. When something comes in your life, you have to say, does it go against the Word of God? Because you know what? Nehemiah had the Word of God. The Word of God to him was build the wall. Finish it. Don't take your eyes off the prize. What's the prize to you and I as Christians? To get to heaven. To finish at the finish line. To get to your deathbed and have walked with God your whole life. To not get away from God. That's the, that's the, the goal. That's the focus, right? We don't, we don't stray and say, you know what? It's, sometimes it's fun to, to just hang around with people in the world. There, some, there's some good people out there. You know, some of the stuff they're doing, it, it's not a salvation issue. We, it's okay if they do it. Well, just because they do it don't mean I'm going to do it. When you start pitching your tent towards Sodom, you will be doing it. You will get there. You start looking on people and saying, well, maybe it's not wrong for them. I wouldn't do it, but yes, you would. 
you start watching them and hanging out with them and saying, well, they're good people too. Let me tell you who's good. Jesus. Amen. Let me tell you what you're supposed to be doing. Be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Set the standard of Jesus and not your best friend. That's right. That's right. Okay. And in the last passage, and this is an entire chapter, so you want to just bookmark this, and that's Joshua chapter 9. And Joshua chapter 9, those of you who remember when we studied the battles of Joshua, and we went through there, and we looked at how Joshua and the people of God dealt with each battle, from Jericho all the way through and overcome the promised land. That is a great study. I might just do that one next after I finish Nehemiah. That is a great study in the walk of a Christian. If you remember, there was only one group that Joshua didn't overcome. Y'all remember? There were the Gibeonites. In each battle, Joshua went in, and, the, and I think it was it, the defeated Ai, he went in, and they had to turn tail and run because there was somebody in the group that had taken gold and hid it in their tent. They had taken some of the, the loot they saw something, a little idol or something, and they brought it in. And when he found out about that, he, because people had died because of this, him and his family were put to death because they didn't obey. They didn't obey. Well, that's not fair, God. Yeah, it is, because it kept it from spreading. It's like having to have your hand amputated or having a spot on your skin amputated, taken off because it's cancerous. It was taken out to save the whole. And in this Joshua chapter 9, you'll read about the Gibeonites. Joshua had, had um, defeated army after army of the enemy, and the Gibeonites had heard about it. And they, they were in fear, and they said, we can't stop these people. God's on their side. We can't overcome them. Hmm, what can we do to save our own necks? And it says that they... Put, they found old shoes that had holes in the bottom of them. They found clothes that the sleeves were pulled off of and they were torn. And they got old pieces of cheese out of the garbage can that was dried up. And they found an old wine skin that was cracked and would barely hold wine. And they put and found old bread that you could have killed a dog with it if you'd hit him with it because it was so hard. They found all this old stuff and they, and they came up and they said, let's, let's go meet them. And they, a group of them went up like, and they said, we've traveled from so far. We live way over yonder. We live 100 miles away. We just live so far. And we've heard that you have defeated all these enemies. And we're just poor people. This cheese was fresh when we left. This wine was new. And it's old. And they said, we're just poor people. And we just want to make a, an agreement with you that you won't hurt us. And Joshua said, okay, I'll have mercy on you. And it sounded godly, didn't it? Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Between right and almost right. What actually happened was, they got like three miles down the road. I think it was like three days journey, but they went three days journey and they came into the town of these Gibeonites and he was mad. He said, you have lied to us, but because we've vowed to not kill you, you will be slaves to us from now on. It says that they would cut firewood, and they would draw water. That's going to be your servitude duty. And they did that. And at the time of the writing, it says they were still that way. He had to keep his promise because as a man of God, he, you be careful about the promises you make. He said, I won't kill you, but then he got down there and they had lied to him. He saw those same people. They had their new clothes on. They didn't have holes in their shoes. They wasn't eating rock hard bread either. And when they got down there, and in verse 19 of that, that um, chapter says, 
And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. There it is. We didn't pray about it. Joshua didn't say, well, before we agree with you, we need to stop and pray about this. Let me just give you a modern example. Just a, a what if. You get out of your car and there's a man over there in tattered clothes and he's got a cup and he says, veteran, homeless, please help. Well, you know you need to help him, right? You, surely we need to help this poor man. You know what? There's this new story called 2020. I don't know if they're still on the air. Many years ago, they started following this person like that. This person, he would, he would be seen every day, and he would get money in there. And then he would get his money in his little dirty bag, and he would start limping off to the side. And he would go off maybe half a mile away, and he'd get in a new Cadillac. He'd throw that thing in, and he'd drive, and he had a huge house. And this man made a living begging. I try to use discernment when I, I don't, I don't like give to everybody, but I give when the Lord says that man's in need. Right. Right. And when I do, I can always tell it. I'm not telling you I've made a mistake in giving to people before. I've been in a hurry and like, I just, you know, don't, don't miss the opportunity. Lord, just, you just use it. You just make sure that they do use it. You don't know those people are going to go buy more alcohol. They may be alcoholics. They may be living out in homeless because they want to live homeless. Yes, some people do that. Some people don't want to work and they just are happy. They're just living out, being homeless. But you use discernment. Joshua said, we didn't ask counsel at the mouth of, of the Lord. You didn't pray about it. Discernment is being able to tell right from almost right. Uh, back to Nehemiah chapter 6, and we're going to finish up. Verse 14. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets that, they, that would have put me to, in fear. So there was a woman named Noadiah that was prophesying against him too. Have you ever been in a very select group? and have other churches say, what you're doing is not right. How can you call yourself a church? Really? You don't believe what mainstream denominations believe. Well, maybe mainstream denominations are wrong. All right? Mm -hmm. Verse 15, so the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month, Elul, in 50 and 2 days. And it came to pass that when our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. That's what they didn't want to hear. They didn't want to hear it was finished. 17, moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. Uh, wait just a minute. The nobles of Judah, these are actual Jews. These are Jews, part of Jerusalem, but they are the nobles, the rich people. You remember how a few chapters back he's made them ill because right, they didn't want to work with all their heart. They kind of like, I used to term gold brick, right? We're going to have fun as the nobles because these little peasants are building the wall. Let's have a nice cold drink and sit and watch them at the table at the restaurant while they're all doing their little evangelism. We don't have to bring people to Christ because somebody else is doing that. We're not called to evangelism. The nobles were scolded because they didn't do. And he said, I'm going to make a note of you. Here they are writing letters to the enemy. Verse 18, For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah and the son of Ara, and his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Beri Kyle. Also, they reported this his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Okay, in a nutshell, these people that should be of the house of God, they are they are Jews. They had 
they had married, they had intermarried with these people. And he was a son-in-law taken here of Shechaniah. And so there was a little connection there, a little family connection. You know, that can cause a lot of problems in churches, can't it? Having a little family connection. Well, pastor, you don't need to be talking about the sin of fill in the blank because my son is. And I'm the biggest giver in this church. I just wanted to remind you, I'm the biggest giver in this church. And if you preach against that, I'm going to quit giving you money. And look at what it said in 19. They reported his good deeds before me. What, what Nehemiah is saying, they told me all about how good Tobiah was. His good deeds. Well, Tobiah gives to the poor. But Tobiah was trying to stop the work of God. And they uttered my words to him. Do you see the do you see the difference in the terminology here? They reported his good deeds to me and they uttered. The word even is ugly, isn't it? Yeah. They uttered what I was doing. It's almost like, do you know what Nehemiah's done? Nehemiah, he, he thinks he's going to build a wall. He's setting himself up as a king. Why would he be doing this? They never even thought to ask, God, did you do this? God, is this of your will? They should have gotten excited about seeing the walls, right? And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. The devil will always try to stop you in fear. He will always try to get you from doing God's work by being afraid. I'm afraid to tell people about Jesus. I'm afraid to talk about this to my husband. I'm afraid to really scold my children. I don't want my children mad at me. I ran one child off because I was trying to correct him, and I just don't want to talk to the rest of them. You see what the fear can do? You had one child that, that ran astray and ran out into the world, and you think, I was too hard on them. I, I was too strict on them. I shouldn't have ever told them what to do. I should have not talked so much about this Jesus stuff because we can't we just be in the middle of the road? Can't we just can't we just have to hear that this relationship's really important to me, so I don't want to hurt your feelings. So I won't tell you anything. You're wrong. You're not using discernment. You're not being walking in the grace that God's given you. Amen. This was a great chapter, and I hope you learned from it. We're, we will move on and finish the book of Nehemiah, and I want you to remember these five things. There was the symbol of grace that Paul said he took pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses. A narrow place. Maybe you are in a narrow place right now. Maybe, maybe your life has got you funneled down where... You used to do this, and used to do this, and used to do that. Now you got through time where you're just doing this. That's good. That's good. Focus. Amen? Well, all these other things, got this thorn in my flesh. I can no longer do this. I can no longer do this. I can no longer do this. Whatever it is, I can no longer. You know, I wear hearing aids. I don't hear everything. But you know what it's caused me to do? It's caused me to hear from God better. I don't hear all the stuff down here as much. I try to. But I don't need these to hear from God. That's right. right? So there's an, there's an example of an infirmity that I have that's caused me to focus on God. You'd be surprised how many distracting sounds there are in the world, right? Let's pray. Father, we come before you today asking you that you help us to understand that the things in our life that are challenges, the infirmities, the reproaches, the persecutions, the distresses, the necessities, Lord, these things that we pray that for often to give us this or to take us out of that. Lord, these things we want to take pleasure in. We want to see them in a different light today. We want you to give us your grace. Father, we ask, Lord, that those who are being challenged right now by the devil and they're being made to believe that they're going the wrong way, that maybe they were going the right way. Maybe that because these things came on them that the devil said, see there, you're, you're going the wrong way. Help us to know, Lord, to have discernment today. Give us discernment through the Holy Spirit of God and through your word. Help us to have discernment, Lord, to know what to do. 
and help us to walk in it in the straight and narrow today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen.